Howdy y'all, namaste, and welcome back. Uh, continuing on this philosophical quest uh, as we're continuing in Unit 3 on Plato's d Dialogues and uh, starting Chapter 9, which I'm calling In Between Lost and Found. I'm kind of proud of that title. Um, got a couple different meanings in there, whether, you know, we how you put use punctuation. But it could be in between lost, comma, and found, or it could be in between lost and found with no punctuation. Two different meanings, which might confuse you right now, but hopefully by the end of this less, less end of this lesson, lecture, um, chapter, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, have some more meaning there. So, um, just a disclaimer: this is my second time recording it. Um, everything went wrong the first time. Hopefully, this will be the last time I'm recording it. Um, but uh, also, the the goal: this is this chapter is divided into five different sections. I'll give you a quick overview of those sections now and the goal is to get this all done in an hour and 15 minutes uh, any college student should be able to pay attention and focus for 75 minutes that's a normal um, period of a lecture so uh, and any professor should be able to get their point across in that period of time so that's what we're going to do right chapter 9 75 minutes starting now actually we already started okay so this unit like i said or this chapter rather is divided into five sections so we're going to start with comparative theology now comparative theology is Another method of doing philosophy. Um, so in the past we've studied phenomenological method. Comparative theology is basically just phenomenological method on steroids, right? We're just like, instead of using one anchor, one canon of text to anchor our discourse, we're gonna have two, right? Um, and so I'll say more about that method as we go forward. But it will also help us to interrogate and question what do we mean by an anchor? Thinking about what this anchor does philosophically, epistemologically, discursively, ethically, all those sort of things. So we'll think more deeply about what does, what does this anchor do. Then we're going to dive um, back into Plato's uh, Allegory of the Cave, um, just briefly. So in chapter 8, remember the title of chapter 8 was um, The Upward Journey of the Little Soul. And we talked a lot about that, that upward journey, the journey out of the cave and the journey back down into the cave and the metanoia this turning that happens on both ends of that journey. Um, but, uh, but not so much about the little soul. So Socrates uses this word, um, sukarions, little soul. Um, and so thinking about, we want to think more about what does he mean by that? What's going on with that sort of language of the little soul and the whole soul, the whole suke. So remember at the end of the upward journey, he says we have to turn the whole soul, the whole suke, whole suke. So we'll, um, go back and interrogate and investigate what does that mean. Then we'll turn to another Plato, uh, another dialogue by Plato um, called the Symposium. The Symposium is a series of speeches and dialogue in between them, um, five speeches. We're just going to look at uh, two of them very briefly. But the um, main one we're going to look at is a dialogue between Socrates and Diotima. So Socrates gives a speech, and his speech is in the form of a dialogue that he had with his teacher, Diotima. So we'll learn what she has to say about eros or erotic desire, erotic love, and particularly the conception of erotic desire. By the way, I don't know if I mentioned it before, but I am sick, recovering from um, from an illness, been sick all week. I think it's the Rona, but you know, just doing the best we can. Um, and so I know my voice sounds funny to me at least. Um, we're also going to investigate what um, Diota calls metaxi, or the in-between. So the first word of this um, chapter uh, title is in-between, so metaxi. What is, it, what is Diotima trying to do with that in-betweenness? We talked a little bit about in-betweenness in the last chapter. I mentioned Heidegger's you know, definition of a human person is um, das Wichen height das Wichens, the in-betweenness of the in-between, and we talked about the upward journey of this little soul and the in-between, in-between the prisoners in the cave and the outside realm, you know, where the sun shines and that sort of thing. Uh, philosophy happens in this in-between, so we'll um, think a little bit more about and ask, you know, what is it, what's going on here? What's Plato trying to do with this metaxi or in-betweenness? Then we're going to turn to something quite different and look, uh, uh, turn our attention to a different canon of text and look at the uh, a passage from um, Greek New Testament, from the Greek scriptures um, on these little three little stories about lost and found. And then finally, we'll try and wrap all this stuff together and come back full circle 
to that idea again about the whole soul, the little soul and the whole soul, the um, sukarion and the hole suke, the whole soul. And what does that mean in terms of justice and the kind of questions that we've been asking so far this semester? So without further ado, and with that, you know, big overview. So it's always good to keep the forest, you know, keep, keep in mind the forest. Don't lose the forest for the sight of the trees. So we're going to dig into the trees and get into some of the nitty gritty here. But let's make sure that we keep it in context of the overall forest and the overall thing that we're trying to do in this philosophical quest. All right. So I'm also going to try and throw some dad jokes in here along the way. Um, so just to recap, right, we're in the middle of Unit 3. Unit 3 is on the Dialogues of Plato. We've already looked at um, a sec an excerpt from Plato's Republic, the Allegory of the Cave. We Previously this semester, we looked at the Divided Line, which is also from Book 6 of the... Um, of Plato's Republic. Now we're going to turn more towards um, another text, the Symposium, particularly this dialogue between Diodema and Socrates. And then after this, uh, for the next chapter, we'll turn our attention to the Phaedrus dialogue, which is another dialogue between Socrates and Phaedrus. And one of the things that we're looking for right now, we're really trying to turn our attention to Eros. In the past, we've looked at logic, right? Um, we had a whole, a whole chapter, chapter seven, no, nope, chapter six on logic. And now we're turning to um, the idea of desire. And then when we get to the Phaedrus, we'll look at both of those together, the, the relationship between logic and desire um, and rhetoric when we get to the Phaedrus. So comparative theology. So quick review here, right? So in chapter two, we talked about epistemology. What does our knowledge stand on? What grounds our discourse? What grounds our knowledge? We need to have some sort of firm basis for our knowledge to stand on so that we can have meaningful discussions about, you know, with other humans about things like justice, beauty, freedom, goodness, ethics, all those sort of things, right? So what, what's, what can hold and what can ground our knowledge and our discourse together about those sort of things, you know? Or remember our sponsor for that episode was Epi Boots, boots that keep you grounded, right? Epi Boots. Boots that keep you grounded. <laughs> right, so epistemology, we're trying to ground our knowledge in something. And we looked at Immanuel Kant about it in chapter 5, when we we're talking about the first principles of philosophy. And uh, as Kant pointed out, the basis for knowledge, the foundation for knowledge, the source, that foundation, is by definition unknowable, right? But he also emphasized that we need it, or as Kant said, we can't do without one, right? We have to have something that grounds uh, our knowledge so that um, they can anchor our knowledge so that we avoid relativistic ethics in a society that just crumbles under the fact of, you know, everybody has a different opinion and therefore, you know, everything's okay or something or nothing really matters. So we have to have something that anchors our discourse and anchors our discussion, particularly about um, knowledge, truth, ethics, those sort of things. And as Kant said, you know, since we need one and we can't know what it is, we just have to stipulate something. And Kant chose to follow Descartes, you know, stipulating the knower as the anchor, but we already, you know, shown why that can't, why that's not good. Um, so instead we turn back maybe to Plotinus, right? So since we can't anchor knowledge in the knower, the way Descartes wants us to, um, but Hume has proved why that can't be, right? then maybe we should do what Plotinus did, which is anchor knowledge in a particular canon of texts. And right now we're going along with Plotinus and anchoring our knowledge in these discourses by Plato, these dialogues by Plato. Now, uh, one of the things that Plotinus did, said that you know um, Plato's dialogues can anchor academic philosophy. By academic philosophy, I mean you know philosophy that comes from the academy, which was founded by Plato. And Plotinus said, you know, if we're going to use these texts to anchor our discourse, then we need to use all of them, right? You can't just pick and choose and say, well, like, all right, I want to analyze this text and give it this meaning. But then if this, in, if I interpret this other text in a way that contradicts that one, then, you know, what is it all? Then that's not a, a good anchor, right? So all of the texts have to anchor us. We have to make sure that our interpretations are consistent throughout all of these dialogues of Plato. Otherwise, we wind up with cognitive dissonance like we talked about before, and the logic of it all just breaks down, and then it's, you know, it's not an anchor. So, um, so in other words, we have to use all of the text. It's all or nothing, baby, right? 
So Plotinus, one of the things that Plotinus pointed out that I haven't talked about before um, was this particular dialogue by Plato called the Parmenides Dialogue, one of the shortest ones. Um, Plotinus said this is kind of a, this can be a keystone text. Now, oddly enough, we're not really talking about Parmenides Dialogue this semester, although I will talk about it right now, um, but we're not going to read it or anything like that. But one of the reasons that Plotinus went to this one was because he said so many other, you know, philosophers were just ignoring it. Um, and the reason they were ignoring it was because if they were to pay attention to it, it would like break down their entire understanding of Plato. Um, but in this text, you know, Plato interrogates the, the relation, the ontological relationship between the one and the many. Um, and, uh, so, you know, if good is one, if there is one good, if there is one truth, if there is one thing that is good, then that goodness is one. And then any many any of the many instances of that must participate in that one. We'll, we'll look at that in a, in a minute. But a key point from this section is this. An anchor only functions as an anchor to the extent that you tie yourself to it, right? Or as they say in poker, we're all in, right? In other words, the anchor for the anchor to do what it's supposed to do, which is anchor us to a particular position, if we're going to anchor and try to see this text from all around, we've got to be tied to the anchor, right? If you just drop your anchor in, but you're not really connected to it, you're only really tied to the text, then it's not performing its function of being an anchor. You can call it an anchor, right? But it's not doing its ontological function. It's not functioning as an anchor. So previously we talked about like functioning as a father versus just being you know, biological father by, you know, donating sperm or something. It's different than functioning in that way. Likewise, to be an anchor, we have to tie ourselves to it. It has to be meaningful to us. So, comparative theology, the comparative theolo theological method, as I said, it's kind of like phenomenology on steroids. So, we've got two different anchors this time, right? So, one canon of text to anchor our discourse, but then we've got another canon of text that also anchors our discourse. And both of these have to function as an anchor, meaning we have to tie ourselves to them. How do we do that? Well, it's sort of a back and forth, right? We're gonna kind of journey from one tradition to another tradition, which means we have to lift our anchor, right? To journey requires lifting your anchor, but then sojourning in that other tradition and that other canon of text means that we have to like really commit to it, right? Anchor ourselves there, even if it's just for a period of time, right? sojourn is like journeying somewhere but then staying there getting to know the people getting to know the text getting to know the context right really making it our home even if it's just for a period of time and then return to our home text or home anchor or home tradition or whatever but with a changed perspective right and that because these anchors are where we get those first principles of philosophy so who am i where am i and why am i here then, you know, as we experience, as we sort of journey, lift our anchor, sojourn, drop our anchor, and then lift our anchor in return, then we'll have a changed perspective about those fundamental questions about the nature of being. So comparative theology comes from this guy, um, often looked at sort of the founder or, fa or father, if you will, of comparative theology, um, Professor Frank Clooney, Francis Clooney. He's a uh, professor at Harvard, um, Harvard University, and uh, formerly at Boston College, uh, where he was for 30 years. But I know him from Harvard and um, seen pictured here, you know, uh, anointing me uh, with, my, with my doctorate degree or whatever. Um, so we've talked about uh, Clooney previously. I mentioned this book, Seeing Through Text, right? And in the last chapter, we talked about uh, using these, using texts in order to anchor our discourse but for the purpose of trying to see one another through these texts, see the world through texts, right? Um, this time we're going to shift a little bit um, and look at his methodology in this other book, um, Theology After Vedanta. And in this text, he really kind of gives sort of the foundational text in a lot of ways of comparative theology. And one of the things that he says in there is that um, a comparative theologian, talking about comparative theologians, he writes, Unwilling to reduce their own tradition's faith claims to mere information, which does not require response. Comparative the theologians likewise refuse to reduce other traditions' faith claims to mere safe information, right? Knowledge 
taken seriously changes the lives of the knowers. In other words, right, we've got to really commit to that anchor. And um, so the anchor only functions as an anchor to the extent that you tie yourself to it, even if it's only for a period of time, right? And a text can only anchor philosophical discourse if we approach that text sincerely, genuinely, respectfully, and even reverently, right? Respecting the text as it is. So um, I'm going to try and end each one of these little sections with a dad joke, right? So, um, you know, why do I tell dad, dad jokes? What? Why do I tell dad jokes? Because he usually laughs. Okay, my dad. Okay, moving on. Chapter, section two, right? Um, so in chapter eight, we talked about the uh, chapter eight was the upward journey of the little soul. Right? We talked a lot about that upward journey, but now I want to go back and sort of question and interrogate what do we mean by that little soul, or what does Socrates mean by that little soul? This is a very unusual term, as I mentioned before. It um, doesn't really occur outside of, um, outside of Socrates. There's another philosopher, Epicritus, who, who cites, um, who, who uses it once. Um, we know that through Marcus Aurelius. This is sort of like, don't need to know all this. But um, he described uh, the little soul carrying a corpse, right? And so uh, he describes a human as a little soul carrying a corpse. But um, it's, not, it's not a term that's used very much. Um, but it's a, it's a term that Socrates uses at a number of points. So then, you know, I really wanted to dive into that text, into that word, in fact, and see, like, of the few times where Socrates uses the word, are there any sort of like, what can we figure out what he's, is there any consistencies, you know? So using this word in a consistent way. And in fact, he is. So in all of these cases, so let's look at this one. Um, this is a passage from the Republic, from the, um, from the Allegory of the Cave that we looked at last time. And he uses this word, uh, sukarion, um, or little soul, to describe people who are selfish and clever, right? People who are using the skills that they have, particularly the skills of reason, logic, um, and their int intellect, using those skills, like we talked about before, right, these skills are tools which can be used to oppress or to liberate. Like a knife can be used to make your own dinner, provide your own meal. A knife can be used to provide food for the hungry. A knife can be used to stab somebody in the back. Or a knife can be used to liberate people from the cave, right, to tie their bonds, release them from their bondage. Um, but he uses the word little souls to refer to those people who are using these tools in a way that is inherently selfish, right? They're only concerned with their own little soul. They're only sukarion. It's people who are selfish and clever and using their tools um, to that end. And we see that pretty consistently. Um, what about the word, the phrase whole soul or hole suke? Now in Greek, the word hole can mean each or every or whole. In fact, it's where we get the English word whole. It's just the same word. So hole suke, or e so it could be each soul, every soul, the entire soul, the whole soul, right? Um, and so where we saw it in the previous chapter um, was this metanoia, right? The, the little soul goes up on this um, journey out of the cave to see the sun, to see the truth, to see the light and all those good things. But then Socrates says there must be another metanoia and turning around where this uh, little soul goes back down into the cave in order to educate, in order to lead others out of the cave. And as he said, education is not putting sight into eyes that lack it. It's not putting knowledge into souls that lack it. But instead, you know, recognizing that knowledge is already there and the eyesight is already there, but instead we need to turn the whole soul, right? Turn the whole body, he says, but also turn the whole soul. So that's one of the ways he uses this phrase, hole suke. And we will see this phrase come up again in the Phaedrus dialogue, which we look at next. And that's where, um, that's one of the places where Socrates gives us a clear, you know, um, rather famous definition of the word soul. Um, but he does so using this phrase, the whole soul. So uh, good to think about the relationship between the little soul or the psycharion. And also remind ourselves that in English, we have the words mind and soul, right? So previously we've talked about in systematic philosophy, Got that anthropology, one of the first principles of philosophy, right? What does it mean to be a human person? Any human person is going to have those basic elements, right? Body, soul, mind, spirit. 
And in English, soul and mind tend to have very different meanings, uh, or at least different meanings. Whether or not they're very different, it depends on the person and the context, I suppose. But they are different words with different meanings. In Greek, you don't have that. In Greek, you have the word psyche. Psyche means mind and soul. It has both of these meanings right there in that one word, right? So maybe we could call it mind soul or something like that. But uh, recognizing that little soul and little mind in English kind of have different meanings. But Socrates just uses the word psychirion or little psyche, um, carrying both of those meanings. Now, he uses this term um, psychirion or little soul, little mind or whatever. Also in the Theatetus dialogue, which is another dialogue that we're not looking at. Um, it's another text on epistemology. And there he uses it the same way that he used it in the allegory of the cave, which is to describe people that are egocentric, that are only concerned with themselves, that are clever, and use their skills of logic and reason and these other philosophical schools, skills, to manipulate people, right? They're only concerned with their own little soul, um, not with the, well, not with those around them, of the whole soul. So, like I said, in, when we turn to the Phaedrus dialogue in the next chapter, we'll see that the whole soul, the holy suke, is eternal, um, and some other things, that, you know, the way that he de defines soul there. I want to talk briefly about the, um, the uh, Parmenides dialogue, um, since we're not looking at that text this semester, um, but still important. So, in the Parmenides dialogue, you have this discourse, like I said, between Socrates and Parmenides. The role's reversed here. Usually Socrates is kind of like the winner of these discourses, but in that one he clearly loses to Parmenides. And Parmenides argues that, you know, if you're going to talk about these forms, forms of goodness, forms of um, justice, form of, you know, all these ideas and things, then shouldn't there be like a form of forms, which is just one? Shouldn't there just be one form that is good? And then how do you reconcile that one good with the existence of good things or beautiful things or beautiful people or beautiful souls, right? So what's the relationship between goodness as one and good person or just person or something like that? So what's the relationship between the one and the many? Now, this is a super, super difficult um, philosophical concept to get. We could spend, I would love to spend a full semester just on that question. But, you know, I can give like a super brief version of the philosophy, um, one of the ways I found successful is this. If you think about a team, all right, so my, da my daughter, um, my daughter loves to play soccer, and she's, she's pretty good at soccer, um, but, you know, when she was, she's a teenager now, when she was much younger, um, I remember just going to one of her soccer games and maybe thinking about this stuff, you know, I'm always thinking philosophy, and um, watching her team on the field, team in quotes, right? So there were nine players on the team and um, they were all out there. They were wearing matching jerseys. They looked like a team, but they weren't acting like a team, right? It's just like, if you've ever seen young kids play soccer, um, you know, especially grade school kids, they, they just all go in with one mindset, which is like ball, kick, kick the ball. They don't always even think about like, which direction should I kick the ball or who's got the ball right now? They just like ball, kick, right? And so this is the way that their team was playing. It was like all these nine different players on the field doing their own little thing. They weren't really working as a team and they were losing. But then something changed. I remember this one particular day, this one particular game, when all of a sudden just something changed and all of the players on the team started working as a team. They started working together. They started you know, reading each other's body languages. They started passing to each other and anticipating passage and like really working as a team. So nine different bodies, nine different little souls, but they were working as one team, right? So the relationship between teamness and the players, right? The team isn't anything other than just the players. It's not like you go get a bunch of players and then you add some teamness. It doesn't work like that, right? The team, what makes these players, these many players into one team is how they function together, how they work together, right? So the, the one team becomes manifest through the way that these many players interact with one another, right? So that's kind of what we mean by the whole and the parts or the one and the many. The one team is the many players and the many players, but many players is not necessarily one team, right? So they could be working all against each other. But to manifest teamness, they should be the many working in harmony with one another, working in concord together. 
right? Um, so Parmenides discusses this, not quite in that same way, um, but in the dialogue, uh, in his dialogue with um, Socrates called the Parmenides Dialogue, where the good is one and the one is the, is the many. The many is the one and the one is the many. Um, therefore, we only get out of the cave together, right? It requires this turning together as a team, everybody in society kind of getting out of the cave together, this metanoia of the whole soul. Dad joke. Oh my goodness, what was the dad joke here? Oh, I remember the dad joke now. Um, so yeah, I have this, uh, I have this fond memory, you know, of being a little kid and um, building sandcastles with my grandfather. But then my mother took the urn away. All right. Next section, section C, metaxi and erotic conception. It's a very provocative, erotic title. So next we're gonna look at this, um, another dialogue by Plato, one of the most famous ones called the Symposium, uh, which is like a party, right? And these, these folks got together and they begin by saying, man, we really just drank too much. We had too much of a party last night. Let's do it again. This time take it a little bit easy on the spirits. And instead we get sort of inspired or intoxicated, if you will, with the spiritual discourse that they're having with one another, spirit of dialogue and the spirit of wisdom and philosophy. And they, their, their conversations turn on eros or erotic love. What does it mean? What do we mean by erotic love? So this is called an erotic dialogue. It, entail, it includes these five speeches by five different you know, characters in Plato's discourse. Um, giving their perspectives on what are we, there's sort of odes to erotic love or to reflections on erotic love. And I just want to mention two of them. Um, one of them I'll briefly mention is by this uh, doctor, the scientist or medical doctor called Eryximachus, I think is how you pronounce his name. And um, he says that, uh, he begins by saying, you know, as a doctor, as a scientist, I noticed that ero what we call erotic love it's actually present all over nature. I see it everywhere. I see it between, not just between humans, but between animals and even between plants. And, you know, just see it among all living beings, this sort of erotic attraction that draws, um, that draws living beings together. And he says, eros, therefore, is kind of a force of nature, an emphasis on the word force, right? But also a natural force. So maybe all those words, right? Eros is a force of nature, says Eroximachus. Um, then uh, we get finally to a speech by Plato. Now, when, I'm sorry, a speech by Socrates. Now, when Socrates gives his speech, um, you know, Socrates isn't a big fan of speeches. We'll see this uh, again in the Phaedrus dialogue. He's not a big fan of speeches or writing or any of that kind of stuff, right? He describes writing as masturbating on the page, as spilling the seed. Also, speeches are performing a similar function, right? What Socrates cares about is dialogue, discourse. So even when he gives his speech, in the Phaedrus dialogue, I'm sorry, in the symposium, he says, actually, instead of giving a speech, I'm going to give a speech, but I'm going to give it in the form of a dialogue. I'm going to remind, I'm going to tell the story about this dialogue that I had a long time ago. And it's sort of like a story within a story within a story within a story, because it's like, anyway, it doesn't matter. But it's a memory of a dialogue that happened when Socrates was much younger. And it's a di dialogue that he had with his teacher. So his teacher in this case was a woman named Diotima. Now Diotima um, was, um, I mean, presumably a real person, but um, could also be sort of a nickname referring to another uh, real woman at the time named Aspasia. Now Aspasia was a very, um, was maybe the most powerful woman of her time, uh, definitely the most powerful woman in Athens at that time. And um, she was also, you know, seemed to have some sort of medical expertise. And there was a plague that was going on at that time that was caused by war. So the, um, it was a war and they just, the, the ruler, Pericles, I think it was, just said, let's just leave the bodies out there, like as a warning to people not to attack us. Let's just leave the bodies to rot. But then that caused disease, right? So then a plague broke out because you don't do that. Um, and then so Aspasia was kind of responding to that and, and um, you know, disturbed by that ethically, morally, but also, you know, medically uh, and looked to that ethical decision as also causing, um, you know, causing this plague. 
Anyway, Aspasia is also, by the way, I'm a big fan of Assassin's Creed, especially this, um, the game Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Um, and I love that game. I played it all the way through a couple times. And uh, Aspasia is a main character in that. Um, it's very historically based. Socrates is also a character in that. And um, so in, if you played Assassin's Creed, Cassandra is the main character. Um, you play Cassandra or Alexios in the, in the game. And she meets Socrates and then she goes to a symposium um, where they have discourses on erotic love. And uh, at that symposium, she meets Aspasia. Um, anyway, just aside, doesn't really have anything to do with what we're doing. Does it? Maybe it does. Anyway, Diodema. So, um, so we have this discourse that Socrates recounts. And uh, he says, all right, so in this, when it, you know, I was with my teacher, Diodema, and she gave me this lesson on erotic love. And I want to, he said, I want to try and tell it to you, recount it to you in the way that it happened, right? This sort of back and forth dialogue. And I want to get, I want to read that text, right? And read the dialogue because the dialogue, the back and forth is, you know, sort of important for philosophy as a mode of discourse or dialogue, which we're having, even though I'm just in a room alone talking to a camera. Nevertheless, right, this, this is what we're doing. Um, but I want to give you a little bit of preview so that you can understand it as we're going through it, and then we'll do a recap at the end. But, um, so, quick preview. Diodemus says that eros, right, we're talking about eros, erotic desire, you can use lots of different terms, love, desire, but we're talking about a particular kind of erotic love or desire. And Eros, Eros is also a character, like um, sometimes it goes by the name Cupid in other traditions, or Kama in other traditions, but, you know, a, a personification of erotic love, right? Shooting those little arrows and that sort of stuff. And she says that Eros is neither mortal nor immortal, but something in between mortal and immortal. And it uses the word metaxi. So metaxi meaning in between, which you might remember is the title of this chapter, right? In between lost and found. Um, so take special note of that term in between as we're going through the text. And she says that Eros, the god, or, you know, the, who's not a god, he's in between mortal and immortal, that Eros was conceived, right? So we've got philosophical conceptions, which are conceived through discourse, but then you've also got physical conception, right? Which is conceived through intercourse. So um, here talking about conception of the idea through intercourse of ideas, um, but Eros was conceived by Pinia and Poros. Um, so Pinia uh, is another name, is, it means poverty, right? Lack, absence, um, incompleteness, uh, and personified as, you know, a homeless begging woman in the text. Uh, and so it's conceived by the union of Pinia and Poros. Poros is the opposite, right? Abundance and resource and resourcefulness, all this kind of stuff. Anyway, Poros had a party celebrating the birth of Aphrodite. Then he was filled with spirits uh, and got drunk, right? Passed out in the, um, in the garden. Penelia slid into those DMs, little Netflix and chill, boom, Eros was conceived. All right, so enough preview. That's what we're going to see. But let's now like turn an actual look at the text itself, okay? So this comes from Plato's Symposium, paragraphs 201D to 212C, sort of improvised translation, a mix of uh, translation by Harold Fowler and another translation by R.G. Berry, and then my own sort of translation and improvisation on those. But um, so a memory of a memory of a memory of a translation, all this kind of stuff. But nevertheless, trying to capture some of the spirits of this dialogue or discourse. All right, so. Socrates begins his speech and he says, he's telling the people there at the symposium, right? I had this chat with my erotics professor, my teach, the, woman, the teacher who taught me about erotic love, named Diodema the prophetess. First, I asked her about the character of Eros. Then I asked her about the effects of Eros. Then it went something like this. And he even says, like, you know, my memory of it is a little foggy, but it was something like this, right? All right, so... Try and get into character or whatever. Diodemus says, You know, Eros is neither beautiful nor good. Socrates is like, What? You think Eros is ugly and bad? Diodemus is like, Hell no. Nah. The opposite of beauty and goodness is not ugliness and badness, right? Check your logic, bro. Right? What hits on the truth cannot be ignorance. 
Diodema says. Therefore, perspective stands between understanding and ignorance. Socrates is like, yeah, facts. I feel you on that, right? Then Diodema says, then don't say that what is not beautiful is ugly. And that what is not good is bad, right? It's bad logic. Likewise, don't say those things about Eros. Eros is neither good, nor beautiful, nor ugly, nor bad. But Eros is in between all these contraries. Socrates is like, all right, but isn't Eros a god? Diodem is like, no way, man. Eros is in between mortal and immortal. Socrates is like, please elaborate. Eros is a great spirit, Socrates. For the whole of the spiritual is between divine and mortal. Possessing what power? Well, the spiritual communicates between gods and humans. Therefore, Eros is in between mortal and immortal. Then Socrates, I just don't know how to say this, but Socrates asked us this random question. He's like, so what's his origin story? And Diodema goes in this rather lengthy, I'm going to shorten it, but rather lengthy story about the origins of Eros, right? So she says, when Aphrodite was born, the gods made a great feast. And among the, the company was Resource, Poros, the son of cunning. Poverty came to our feast and begged for food and wouldn't leave. She just waited outside the door. Now, Resource, having grown tipsy with spirit, passed out cold in the garden. So then, Poverty, seeing an opportunity, got busy, and Eros was conceived. Now, as the son of Resource and Poverty, love, Eros, is a peculiar case. First, he is ever poor, and far from tender or beautiful, as most suppose. He's hard and parched, shoeless and homeless. He sleeps on the bare ground with no bedding. He sleeps on other people's doorsteps and on park benches. True to his mother's nature, he is constantly filled with want. But he also takes after his father in terms of scheming for all that is beautiful and good. He's brave, strenuous, high strung, great hunter, and always strategizing. He's desirous and competent of wisdom throughout life and ensuing or pursuing the truth. He's the master of jugglery, witchcraft, and rhetoric or artful speech, as we'll see in the Phaedrus dialogue. By birth, Eros is neither immortal nor mortal. He dies and is reborn at all hours every day, dying and reviving again and again by force of his father's nature, yet the resources that he gets will ever be ebbing away, so that Eros is always in between poverty and wealth. Eros is between wisdom and ignorance. All right, so Diodema, continues, right? This is just a part of her speech, but she continues and she goes on to explain what she, what's usually called the ladder of ascent. So using Eros, Eros is a natural force. It's a force of nature, right? Newton's second law of, of motion, F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration, right? Eros, this desire is a force which, in, which interacts with bodies to cause things to happen, right? Actions and reactions. Eros is a drive, a force of nature. That force begins at the primary level, the primary erotic force that humans experience is a desire for human bodies, right? A force that exists in between human bodies, especially after puberty, actually, especially during puberty, right? So that humans first feel this drive, this desire, this erotic desire for human bodies, for sex, right? As the scientist in Plato's Symposium states, um, erotic forces are prevalent throughout nature and readily observed among living beings. As we know now, in 2022, 
the erotic force in the way that Diodema describes it in this text is even observable at the subatomic level, right? Quarks and everything. We know even after Einstein, right, that mass and matter bend space time and then draws forces to, towards one another. Um, so it's a, a force that, that draws um, things together. It's kind of uh, contrary to the entropic principle, right, but a force that drives um, things together. Now, Diodema says that if you can, right, so it starts with this sort of drive for physical bodies, an erotic desire for sex and physical, physical, you know what I'm talking about. I think you know what I'm talking about. But Diodema says if you control that and if it, as it gets mature, right, it begins as a desire for physical union and sex, but if controlled and matured, then this erotic force can transcend the body and climb the ladder a little bit more to become eros or desire for the psyche, right? So, you know, if you're like um, swiping right on Tinder, you know, it's like, oh, that's a nice body that I'm attracted to. And then you have dinner and you're like, yeah, chemistry's there or whatever, right? But then over time, you either lose that spark and then you go back swiping right again, or, you know, or that becomes a desire for this, to get to know this person better, right? To know their heart, to know their mind, to know what makes them who they are, right? So then that desire for physical attraction, that physical attraction becomes a desire for an emotional connection, a mental connection, right? So climb using that eros, that eros. The point is, right, here's an important part of the point, is that desire is always a desire for something, right? For something that you don't have. You can't desire something that you have. You desire something you don't have, right? If you're hungry, you desire food. Once you get food, you don't desire food anymore, right? Like beginning of the morning on Thanksgiving, super hungry, desire food. Then at the end of the day, like seven o'clock on Thanksgiving, man, food just like repulses you, right? Like you don't have any desire for food after you've sort of gorged yourself all day, right? So desire is born from a lack, right? Hunger is a desire that's born from a lack of food. Once you get that food, then the hunger dies, the eros dies, right? So the desire is only there and uh, that causes you to get that thing, right? If you're hungry, then you go after food. You get the food, the eros dies, right? But Diotima is saying that eros can, instead of dying, right, it can be used if controlled and used the right way, then it can help us to climb this ladder of ascent. So if you have a desire for sex, get busy, cigarette moment, right? And then that desire right cigarette moment you know what i mean by that right that's that's when the desire for what you had the desire for it's gone right you got you got lucky you had a good night it's fun times cigarette that desire is over and then you're like well i want some food now or whatever it is right but the odom is like well if you take that desire that desire can propel it's a force that can drive us higher and higher up this ladder of ascent so first up is, is a desire for human bodies then it's a desire for the psyche right? And then beginning with the psyche of one person. But then gradually, Theodemus says, climbing the ladder of ascent, one begins to see that every soul, every heart, every mind, every psyche, hole, suke, every, and even every body is worthy of love and therefore worthy of freedom and worthy of justice, right? So this drive that begins in puberty is a drive for sex, a drive for physical contact, for physical union with other bodies, then becomes a desire for an emotional, mental f connection, right, which is uh, a love for the soul, and then that becomes a love recognizing that every soul is worthy of love, every soul deserves that sort of same freedom and justice, and then that drives us up the ladder at the next rung. Therefore, Diodema says, this force drives us towards a desire for laws that ensure freedom and justice for every psyche, hole, suke, and for each body. Diodema doesn't stop there though, right? They can keep going this ladder, keep going up this ladder. First of all, we don't have these laws that ensure all this thing, but then we have a desire not only for the laws, but for something higher, right? For some sort of existential purpose, right? So. As one makes perpetual progress, Eros becomes an existential driving force for goodness, 
beauty, freedom, justice. It's a force that moves bodies to take action to liberate prisoners from the cave, right? It's that force that causes one to go back down in that pathos that Socrates talked about at the beginning of the allegory of the, of the cave. Moving on. So this is, uh, if you've been paying attention, right, then maybe you're seeing some connections here between the, um, what we did in chapter two with the ways of knowing, right, which comes from book six of the Republic, this intellectual knowing, rational knowing, sensual knowing, imaginative knowing. And then in the last chapter, the upward journey of the little soul, we talked about how those correlate or map to these different um, ontologies, right? We, we, using our imagination, the person who gets out of the cave, right? Remember this upward journey of the little soul when they first emerge at first, Socrates at first says at first they'll see, be able to see shadows, but then they'll be able to see images of things and water and that kind of stuff. Then they'll be able to see the things themselves. Then finally understand words and numbers and rational entities. And then finally be able to see the light of the sun itself, right? The sun, which represents truth, justice, goodness, beauty, all those sort of things, right? Here, Diotima's mapping, right? She's just building on to that same structure, right? The same divided line that we've seen before, these ways of knowing, ways of being, and saying same thing with desire, right? First, we have a desire for bodies. Then we have a desire for minds. Then we have a desire for laws. Then we have a desire for justice, and that justice or harmony, beauty, and those sort of things is the existential driving force that determines all of our actions and hopefully determines whether our actions are good or not good. Feel me? Okay, moving on then to section four, lost and found, time for another dad joke. All right, so we've been talking about sex and anchors. So how about an anchor sex joke, right? So what did the anchor say during sex? This just in. Talking about news anchor. This just in. All right, quick review. So comparative theological method. So um, comparative theology is a method, and it's a method that uses two anchors, right? So we've got our one anchor here. Well, we've got, you know, one anchor in the canon of Plato. So we've got lots of different texts, right? So all these texts together constitute one anchor. Um, but then we've got another anchor, right? So we kind of in order to journey from one to another, we've got to lift our anchor, right? So this phenomenology on steroids, we've got this anchor, we're gonna see these texts, see these platonic texts, these platonic dialogues from as many different angles as possible, reading, reading them across one another and trying to make sense of the whole, right? But an anchor only functions as an anchor to the extent that you tie yourself to it. So we've gotta be committed, respectful of the platonic texts, but also of this other text that we go to, right? So this sort of back and forth, forth, journeying back and forth between these two canons of text so that we journey over to another canon requires lifting our anchor. Sojourning requires dropping our anchor, making a new commitment to a new canon of text, right? To sojourn there, to make that our home for a little bit um, and really take those, those texts seriously um, and commit ourselves, tie ourselves to them, right? But then lift our anchor again and kind of come back, return, but the point of doing all this, right? The point of the anchor itself is to help us ground our discourse so that we can understand those first principles of philosophy. Who am I? Where am I? Why am I here? So if we've performed this journey, this existential quest, I guess, you know, of going to another body of text, another canon of text, anchoring ourselves there for a bit and then return, then that, that journey, that quest, will cause us to have a different understanding of ourselves and the world around us, right? So then that makes that journey and sojourn all the more helpful for us to understand. It gives us a new perspective, a new starting point to look at the text that we've been looking at from a new perspective that we hadn't considered, considered before. Make sense? Word. So let's look at this, uh, another text. So we're shifting away. I'm gonna take the dialogues of Plato and I'm gonna put them over here, right? Um, so lifting our anchor, putting our anchor over here in this new body of text. This body of text is also Greek, um, and uh, so it comes from the, from the Greek New Testament, the um, Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke was written, it's a Greek text written um, right around the year 85 CE. Uh, we know pretty well, it's, it's within a few years of that. 
Um, so we don't know who wrote it. Uh, we don't know his name or anything like that. The author doesn't tell us his name. Um, it's attributed to this guy named Luke. Um, we don't know much about Luke either. We don't even really know his name. But um, what we do know from reading the text is that he's wicked smart. He's highly educated. He's a very, very skillful writer, um, a beautiful literary writer. You can study the text of um, Luke and Acts, you know, just as literary um, masterpieces on their own, right? He's somebody who's not Jewish, so he's writing about a Jewish rabbi, but he himself does not seem to come from that tradition, but he's somebody who's had some sort of metanoia, a major conversion, a major turning around. That turning around seems to have happened maybe um, as a result of this other, um, this other guy named Paul, or we don't really know. We don't know, right? But um, this guy, Luke, he wrote two, two books, and both of those books are in the Greek New Testament. So one of the books is the Gospel of Luke, and the other book, in that book, um, you know, he tells the story of Jesus and like the things that Jesus taught and the things that Jesus did, right? So the story of the things that Jesus taught and did. Then he has another volume, volume two, called the Acts of the Apostles, um, which occurs after Jesus is dead and gone. And then it's all the people that came after him that put his words, put his teachings into practice. They do what he did. They used his life and his teachings as an example. And then they did likewise. And like Jesus, they were all executed by the government. Um, so this particular passage that we're looking at comes from Luke chapter 15 and occurs while the rabbi, Jesus, is walking to Jerusalem. And he's walking to Jerusalem in order to protest inequality. Um, at that time, um, the, 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 you know, Jerusalem and Israel were, um, were occupied by the Romans. The Romans were oppressing them and, you know, charging exorbitant taxes and limiting freedoms and all this kind of stuff. Jesus wanted to go and protest those, um, protest that, and um, knowing that he was going to be executed by the government for doing that, which is exactly what happened. So this is on his way. He's like, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to protest. I'm going to get killed. And everybody's like, well, dude, you're going to get killed. And he's like, I just said that, right? And no, I know. It's going to, right? Um, so anyway, he's on his way to, to do that. And on his way, he gives a series of teachings. And this is one of the teachings that he gives. So we're just going to look at it. That's just context. We're not studying the whole canon. We're not doing all that kind of stuff. It's not a religion class, you know, at all. But instead, we're just sojourning, right? We're going to pick up our anchor out of Plato, drop our anchor over here. We've got to be tied to that anchor and take the text seriously. And so let's read the text and just read it on its own and allow the text to speak for itself. And then we'll return, come back to Plato, and see if this experience of reading these parables of lost and found, these three texts about being lost and found um, have any resonance or have anything to say about um, this little soul and the whole soul that we've talk been talking about in terms of Plato. Word. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and he eats with them. So then, Jesus told this parable. Which of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found that one, he lays it on his shoulder and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just as so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who turns around than over 99 righteous persons who don't need to turn around. Or, what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there's no joy in the presence of the angels of God over one, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who turns around. Same word there, metanoia. Then, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me a share of the property that will belong to me. 
So he divided the property among them. A few days later, the young son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country and there squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took over, took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to, to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He re the slave replied, Your brother has come. Your father has killed the fatted calf because he got, got him back safe and sound. Then the brother became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen. For all these years, I've been working like a slave for you, and I've never disobeyed your command. And yet, you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father says to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is yours, all that is mine, is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. All right, end of that. I'm not really going to talk about this text. I'm going to pitch it over to you, right? This would be a good, uh, good thing to include in your podcast discussions, right? How does this text fit in? How does going over and sojourning in this text help us to understand or reflect on the whole soul? Um, and the whole suke as we've talked about, but I'm going to do a little bit of that right now, but mostly leave most of it to you. But I promise you another dad joke. So um, since we talked about, you know, let's just tell a Christian dad joke. All right. So um, there's this guy, right? Uh, and this guy's walking out through the woods, just chilling, just like in nature, enjoying the woods and everything. And all of a sudden he sees this great big bear, right? And this bear's all like, looking at him and wants to eat him and this bear starts charging him and he has no he has no defense he has nowhere to run nowhere to hide he's in trouble so he does the only thing that he, he's a good christian man so he does the only thing that he can think of which is he says a prayer right and he says dear lord please turn this bear into a christian bear and lo and behold that bear that was running right after him stopped in its tracks it sat down on its hind legs it put its front legs up um, like this, and it said a prayer. And it said, thank you, Lord, for this food, which I'm about to eat. Ha ha. Brumch. Okay, so comparative theology has two anchors, right? So an anchor only functions as an anchor to the extent that you tie yourself to it. And as Professor Clooney said, knowledge taken seriously changes the lives of the knowers, right? So how does this parable about lost and found or, you know, forgiveness and that sort of thing, turning around and that sort of, um, how does it change how we understand uh, sukerion, this little soul, and the hole suke, the whole soul? So previously we talked about the upward journey of the little soul, right? 
and that this little soul journeys upwards, but then this little soul should be filled with some sort of compassion or pathos, right? They're right the first sentence of the allegory of the cave. Um, let's combine human nature, pathos, to an education, to the experience of education or the um, paideus, the rearing, child rearing, right? Raising a little soul up into an adult and the lack of formal education to an experience like this. Then he gives the allegory of the cave and this little soul journeys up um, to see the sun. But then he says, but this soul needs to go back down, right? And it has another, needs to have another metanoia. That's how, he began, that's how he ends the allegory of the cave. Each of you must go down in turn to live in the cave, right? To dwell in the cave with the others and to then um, turn the whole soul, right? So he says, um, education is not what other people say, like putting knowledge into souls that lack it, not putting knowledge into empty minds. It's not like putting sight into eyes that can't see. These people can already see. They already have knowledge. They already have, they can think for themselves. They have souls already, right? But education is that metanoia, that turning around. And what uh, this little soul needs to do is turn the whole soul, right? So maybe whole soul is kind of like a team that we talked about before, the many functioning as the one, right? To turn the whole soul from the shadows. We saw in the section on, on Diotima, right? That Eros is a spiritual force of nature that is conceived from a resourceful longing to create something good that is currently lacking, right? So we don't have this thing that we desire, just like you're hungry because you don't have food, then you eat the food, you don't desire it anymore, right? So that eros comes from something that we're lacking, right? And so that desire for what we're lacking can become an existential drive for goodness and truth and beauty and justice, right? So that, and, but it can happen in, you know, in increments through progressive, um, perpetual progress, right? One rung of the ladder at a time. So beginning with a desire for physical intercourse, but then that can be transcended to a desire for intellectual discourse about justice, freedom, beauty, goodness, etc. right? Then we talked about the, uh, where we didn't really talk about, but we've instead read these, um, this, uh, these three stories on lost and found. Now I want to think again about the upward journey of the little soul and this metanoia, right? So as Socrates said, each of you must go down into the cave to find the lost and to hear them into speech, bringing back that Nell Morton quote that we gave early in the semester, right? In order to turn that metanoia, that turning the whole soul, the holy suke, the many is the one and the one is the being of the many. Without freedom for everyone, there, then no one is free. Without justice for everyone, there is no justice, right? As Parmenides said, justice is one. So then you can't have justice. Justice can't be unless justice is everywhere, right? Justice is the being of the many. So these many instances of justice are justice. So if justice is to be one, then it must be everywhere. Feel me? Without justice and freedom for the whole soul, for the whole suke, for each soul and for every soul and for the entire soul, without justice and freedom for the whole soul, there is only the shadow of justice and the shadow of freedom. In other words, we only get out of the cave together. Seems like a good place to end for me and uh, made all this all the way through and just, you know, just over an hour. So definitely fell short um, or made it underneath the wire of my 75 minute goal. I hope that you took a lot away from it. Hope you enjoyed it. And damn, I hope that the sound quality and the video quality recorded this time because I really don't want to do it again. But anyway, hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you for our next um, next stop on this philosophical quest when we'll turn to the um, erotic dialogue of uh, um, a Plato between Socrates and Phaedrus. Peace out.